Welcome back to the second half of Session 9 of History 3375, the CIA in the Third World. In the first half, we looked at Vietnam's history and considered the various elements that contributed to the Vietnamese war against the French from 1946 until 1954 in particular, and especially the forces of a peasantry that had lost vast amounts of land, a disaffected middle class, and of course the power of Vietnamese nationalism, which was a long historical tradition in Vietnam itself, and finally led to the partition of Vietnam into North and South as a result of the Geneva Conference in 1954. That constitutes essentially the historical crisis of Vietnam that now brings the United States to the fore in the affairs of Vietnam. Now, as the United States looked at Vietnam in 1954, it had to assess what it was going to try to do in the South, what could possibly be accomplished. It's one thing for John Foster Dulles to essentially draw a line in the sand and say no compromise, but of course in the end they had to accept a compromise. They were going to get half a loaf, not all of it, and that half a loaf was the South. In looking at Vietnam, the Americans, of course, had a history of sorts with Vietnam. The OSS had been involved with Ho Chi Minh during the war, and in fact, uh, the United States had been increasingly involved in the war in Vietnam from 1946 onward. If we look at this first slide for the second half, uh, the fact is that almost from the beginning of the guerrilla struggle against the French in 1946, the French found themselves uh, with strained resources. After all, they had just endured uh, six years of war with Germany. They had been occupied for much of that time. Uh, their economy was in a shambles. They were rebuilding. And now they were fighting a guerrilla insurgency in Vietnam itself. Not surprisingly, they would turn to the United States as the one major power which had not suffered significant physical damage as a result of the war for assistance in Vietnam. Now, of course, the Americans had a long history of being anti-colonial. Uh, they had supported the French return, or refused to oppose the French return to Vietnam, largely out of expediency, not wanting to damage prospects for French stability after the war, uh, but to ask them for aid uh, to be called upon to actually supply assistance to the French to fight this war to maintain their colonial possession uh, seemed to be stretching things just a bit. But the French had a certain reasoning that they presented to the Americans. They said, look, we're determined to hold on to our colonies. We desperately need them to get our economy going again. So we're going to have to devote considerable resources to doing this, and particularly in Vietnam. Now, if we don't get assistance from you, that means we simply have to send our own resources from Europe to Vietnam. That means we'll have to draw away those resources that you want us to use in the common defense of Europe, NATO, and expend those resources in Vietnam, unless you can help us. So you see, if you give us military assistance, that means we won't have to abandon our commitment to help protect Europe from the Soviet Union. So the Americans essentially faced a form of blackmail. Either they helped or the French would reduce their commitments in Europe. And so the Americans began sending steady streams of military assistance to the French to help fight the war in Vietnam. And indeed, during the 1950s, those streams of assistance were mounting into the hundreds of millions of dollars. And in fact, by 1954, the United States was actually paying more than the French were to fight the war in Vietnam. We weren't sending any troops. This was all in the form of military aid, financial assistance, etc. But we were actually spending more than the French were to fight this war. So the, the Americans are not exactly strangers to Vietnam. They don't have a long history together. This is in Cuba. But on the other hand, they have been involved with the communists through the OSS. And now they were involved in this war against the communists in their assistance to the French. Indeed, during the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the French had consulted with the Americans about what to do. Uh, what could help turn the tide of battle in the Bien Phu. And somewhere in those discussions, the suggestion was made that maybe dropping a couple of nuclear devices would help. Now, later, when these discussions were revealed, 
uh, each side blamed the other for even bringing the subject up. Uh, the French said, well, the Americans wanted to drop nuclear weapons. They thought that would be a good way of solving the problem. And the Americans said, no, you're crazy. We didn't say that. The French asked us to do it, but of course, we weren't crazy. We weren't going to drop nuclear weapons. But it's clear that the French and the Americans uh, were desperate to win at Dien Bien Phu and had considered at least the possibility of using nuclear devices as a way of defeating the communists in 1954. So the commitment by the United States, even before the Geneva Conference, to Vietnam was considerable. Going back to the slide again, uh, other factors will influence U.S. attitudes towards Vietnam uh, in the 1950s. One factor is the question of the Chinese Revolution. In the United States, in the early 50s, indeed throughout the 1950s, there was a foreign policy dispute, if you will, a political dispute within uh, the United States over the question of who lost China. In other words, China was our ally during World War II. We had a long association with China, uh, and yet we failed in the end to defeat the communists. Uh, the nationalists are driven out, and the communists take power in 1950. And, of course, the Democrats blame the Republicans. The Republicans blame the Democrats. Um, this became part of the entire McCarthy-era debate in the United States about looking for communists in the uh, State Department and elsewhere in the government, were they somehow responsible for undermining our efforts in China? So there is an obsession with the idea that you don't want to get blamed for losing a country to communism on your watch. And this would drive both Democratic and Republican presidents in the years ahead that you don't want to appear to be soft on communism. Another thing that influences uh, American administrations, particularly the Eisenhower administration, uh, war were a series of events in Indonesia uh, in 1957 and 1958. Uh, the basic idea being that the United States saw in Indonesia uh, a similar kind of situation, although it really wasn't, uh, a nationalist leader who they believed was at least soft on communism. And the American position there was to try to undermine his regime on the grounds that there was no sense in trying to negotiate with communists. But if necessary, as happened in Indonesia, we might try to break off, and this was an American policy for a while, try to break off part of the country. Indonesia, of course, is an archipelago, a series of islands. Then you might try to break off a part of that country, preserve it for pro-Western forces, and use that to try to turn back a communist revolution. That same kind of mentality permeated the approach to Vietnam. That, well, look, at, if we had to surrender the North because those weak-willed Frenchmen and Englishmen, etc., uh, at Geneva, uh, that doesn't mean we can't use this southern half of Vietnam that we now control to build a pro-Western state and then roll back the communist revolution in the North. And that was, indeed, the thinking of many people in Washington in the 1950s that they could build this base of support in the South, a powerful pro-Western government, and then use that to destabilize the communist North and eventually roll back communism. Part of this thinking also revolves around the idea of nation building, that prominent in the thinking of American policymakers, as we talked about earlier in the course when we talked about American foreign policy, was the idea that Americans now had at their command through the social sciences, through sociology, political science, economics, the mechanisms and the analysis to build modern societies, to take traditional underdeveloped societies, as they were called, and convert them into modern developed societies, and in that way, make them an important part of the Western global society that the United States was trying to create. And Vietnam would play an important part in that thinking. Vietnam would be seen as a laboratory to experiment. Can we build democratic institutions, Western-style political institutions, Western-style bureaucracy and economy in Vietnam, and therefore demonstrate that we are offering a valid, viable alternative to communism? So Vietnam would also take on that significance for Americans, that, that we were going to prove 
that we can reshape societies, make them into modern societies, make them less susceptible to communist influence, and indeed make them a part of the global system that we are trying to create. This thinking was in part emerging as early as 1954. And if we go to the next slide here, you'll see in a memo the National Security Council uh, authored in August uh, 20th of 1954. Uh, the United States began considering its options in Vietnam. And the essential question that the memo was raising was, what can we do in Vietnam? Can we succeed where the French failed? In part, the answer was, well, yes, we can succeed because unlike the French, we're not war weary. You know, the French fought the Second World War and you know, then they had to go through this guerrilla struggle in Vietnam. So the French people were worn out. You know, they didn't have the guts to go on. Huh? On the other hand, the American people aren't war-weary. So we can carry on and succeed in Vietnam where they failed. Of course, what the memo didn't consider was, well, will the American people perhaps be a bit war-weary if we spend the next 10 years fighting a guerrilla war somewhere? <laughs> uh, wouldn't we be in the same situation as the French were in 1954? Won't our leaders wind up talking about a light at the end of the tunnel if we indeed wind up fighting this counterinsurgency battle for a number of years. But beyond that, the memo also said, well, look, at the f problem for the French was that they were colonialists. You know, they were there to exploit Vietnam. But we're not. We're there for nation building. We're there to help Vietnam develop economically, to give it modern political institutions. So we will be welcomed by the Vietnamese, unlike the French. So our experience will be different because we are there for the purpose of nation building, not for the purpose of colonial empire. The Vietnamese wouldn't necessarily see it quite the same way. But in any case, with that memo, the United States clearly has set itself on the path of commitment to the South and sees itself carrying out this mission of nation building in the South. Now, to help carry out that mission, one of the things that the United States immediately does is set up what was called the CIA Saigon Military Mission. That was the name given to this group that was sent to Saigon, which was the capital of the South. And its mission was to assist in every way possible to bring about the emergence of a strong, stable government in the southern part of Vietnam. Heading that mission was an American, Colonel Edward Lansdale, Edward Lansdale had actually been an advertising executive before World War II, uh, then joined the OSS, and was known particularly for his skills in psychological warfare, which would you expect from an advertising man. And he is going to play a central role in trying to build a government in the South. Now, part of that strategy is not just focused on the South, but on events in the North as well. The CIA has a role to play in the North. Specifically, it sends another former OSS officer, now CIA officer, named Lucien Conen to the North. Lucien Conen uh, was a Frenchman. He had been living in the United States at the beginning of World War II and had joined the OSS and become part of the groups that were uh, providing support to resistance movements in Europe. And of course, he was selected because he was fluent in French, and most educated Vietnamese spoke French at least as a second language. So he would have some facility in operating in Vietnam. But he was to go to the north, not the south. In the north, Lucien Conen and those other CIA officers assisting him are working to develop groups that they call stay behinds. These are people who are to be trained to form resistance groups in the North who, to fight against the communists once they take full control. So these would be Northern Vietnamese who were anti-communists who would get training and assistance from the CIA. If we go back to the slide again, uh, among the things that they would do uh, is go around burying weapons in graveyards 
so that when the stay-behinds needed weapons, they'd be able to go get those caches of weapons and use them to fight off the communists. Another effort was economic sabotage, uh, putting acid in oil tanks, uh, storage tanks, so that it would destroy the quality of the acid. Uh, the oil, when the oil was used, it would damage engines and whatever else it was used in. Uh, also putting sticks of dynamite in uh, piles of coal so that when the coal was used on the railroads and thrown into the uh, locomotive's furnace, it would explode and destroy the locomotive. Uh, various forms of economic sabotage, blowing up bridges, etc., doing everything they could to make it as difficult as possible for the communists to gain firm control in the north. So it isn't just a matter of what they're going to do in the south to try to create a stable government. In the north, they're also trying to destabilize the communist government as it tries to take power. The mission in the north also had a focus which was dualistic both in terms of damaging the communists in the north, but also trying to assist the new political forces that they were attempting to create in the south. And that effort took the name of Operation Exodus. That's what the CIA called it. Uh, publicly, it was known as Passage to Freedom. The idea was this, that there were large numbers of Catholics living in the north. And the CIA felt that they, of course, would be a likely group to appeal to that they would logically be anti-communist. Because, of course, the communists are atheists. And they don't have any God. So Catholics would, of course, find that offensive. They would be opposed to communism. And this was a group that they could appeal to. The idea here was to encourage Catholics in the north to flee to the south. Now, this was legal. Um, people were being allowed in the months after the Geneva Conference uh, to move north to south or south to north, depending upon you know, whatever their political affiliation or their preferences were. Uh, but that was simply the fact that they were allowed to. The CIA wanted to specifically encourage this, you know, not just to say, well, you can move if you want to. Here, they wanted to encourage it. So they began issuing... Uh, various forms of propaganda, uh, newsletters, uh, radio broadcasts. They had Catholic bishops reading uh, messages that they had written to their congregations, reporting that the communists were already torturing and murdering uh, young children, that they were sticking bamboo shoots into the ears of young children, puncturing their eardrums so they couldn't hear the gospel being preached, and so forth and so on. So the idea was, look, if you stay here, oh, another one was, uh, that the United States was almost certainly going to drop a nuclear bomb on North Vietnam because it was going communist. And <laughs> you don't want to be here when that happens, right? Uh, so you probably want to leave. Now, if we go back to the slide, uh, one of the people that was critical in this operation uh, was a young Navy lieutenant named uh, Tom Dooley. Uh, Tom Dooley was a, himself a Catholic. Uh, he had been educated at uh, the University of Notre Dame and he joined the Navy. Uh, but he also worked with uh, the CIA in this effort. Now, he would say later that he really wasn't a CIA operative, that look, if the CIA wanted to get Catholics out of the North away from the communists, he was perfectly sympathetic to that. Uh, Dooley was actually a Navy lieutenant. Uh, he was a doctor, and he was stationed on a US naval vessel uh, in Haiphong Harbor, which is right off of Hanoi. Uh, but he was taking an active role in this effort to encourage uh, Catholics to leave and go to the south. And indeed, eventually, many of them would flee the north and go to the south. The idea being both to undermine support for the communists in the north and also to add a million people whom the CIA felt would be strong supporters of whatever pro-Western government they created in the south. Now, Dooley, uh, after this uh, experience, went back to the United States and wrote one of several books, and he became quite famous. These books are well known. They're even condensed in Reader's Digest. So how much better can you be known? Uh, one of the first ones was called Deliver Us from Evil, and it tells the story of the Catholics in the North and the effort to try to save them from uh, the communists. Uh, Dooley then went back uh, to Southeast Asia. He went to Laos, 
uh, and became a medical missionary. He was a very self-sacrificing man. He uh, set up a uh, medical station and was uh, treating people in Laos for various diseases uh, and was also a very devout Catholic. Uh, he died at a fairly early age in the 1960s as a result of skin cancer. And uh, after that, uh, his name was widely circulated and heralded in the Catholic Church as essentially a secular saint. I mean, he's a man who wasn't a priest, but he seemed to have lived a very holy life and had very strong positive influences on people. And as a result, uh, the Catholic Church began uh, a process uh, to make him an official saint of the church. Uh, there's a process that's called beatification, where they investigate your background and make sure that you're really a good person and that uh, they could ascribe a certain number of miracles to uh, you personally, that people have, uh, have prayed to you and had uh, miracles occur as a result. Uh, so they began this process of uh, investigation. However, in the end, the beatification process was halted for two reasons. Uh, one, they found out that uh, Tom Dooley had worked with the CIA. There was at least some evidence of him having worked directly with the CIA. Uh, but then the other thing they found out that really killed him is they found out he was gay. So <laughs> that was it. Uh, so to be a saint, it might be okay to be a spy, but it definitely wasn't okay to be a gay. Uh, and it was also very upsetting to the people at Notre Dame because uh, <laughs> they had put up a statue to him. Um, but in any case, <laughs> You'll be happy to know that one of the interesting things that came out of all of this is that there is now a uh, Tom Dooley uh, Alumni Association at Notre Dame, and it consists of gay alumni. And they will award a scholarship every year, and they name you know, a person, a special person each year who's assisted uh, gays in their life uh, in the United States. So Tom Dooley didn't make a beatification, but uh, he lives on despite that. But Dooley was, I tell this story mostly to tell you about the CIA at this point and its views, uh, people that were working with the CIA, people like Dooley and its own offices, really felt that they were on a crusade, that communism was this enormous threat. And here in Vietnam, they felt they could draw a line, literally, in the sand between the North and the South, and that they could create something better, an alternative for the Vietnamese, uh, a non-communist alternative uh, to where Vietnam was going. Uh, so people like Dooley really had a, you know, a truly religious-like belief in the crusade that they felt that they were fighting uh, in Vietnam in the 1950s. If we go back to the slides, we'll see what, uh, that at the same time in the South, well, this campaign is going on in the North to disrupt uh, communist uh, takeovers and to bring Catholics to the South. Colonel Edward Lansdale was busy building a government in the South. And the person around whom that government is going to be built was Ngo Dinh Diem. Diem, you remember, was the nationalist leader, been captured by the communists, been interviewed by Ho Chi Minh, had refused to join the communists, and then had gone into exile, and in fact lived in the United States. Uh, Diem had many supporters in the United States, including the Catholic Church, because he was a Catholic, uh, the Kennedy family, and many others. Uh, saw him as the ideal choice to go back and lead uh, a non-communist South Vietnam. Uh, so Diem uh, flies to Saigon, and he is greeted there by Edward Lansdale, who's already in position and ready to try to make Diem the leader of the South. Now, this is not going to be an easy task. Lansdale realizes there are numerous groups battling for influence and control in the South. Uh, most of the communists... Uh, being repatriated to the north, not all of them, but most of them. And left behind are a series of factions or groups. Many of them are uh, a combination of religious fraternities, we might describe them, and militias, uh, such as the Cao Dai. The Cao Dai was one of these groups. They, they combined a set of religious beliefs, which were often a mix of Buddhism and uh, Christianity, along with the fact that they ran fairly powerful militias. And they had been a force in Vietnam's uh, life for some time. Uh, they were often associated with criminal enterprises. They ran protection rackets, for example, and that sort of thing. But they were pretty well armed. To deal with them, Lansdale arranges to bribe them, to pay off their leaders to essentially 
continue with their criminal enterprise, but leave the politics to DM and Lansdale. The other problem uh, that they face is that uh, DM has been brought back initially, not to be president of Vietnam, but to serve as the prime minister for the emperor of Vietnam, someone you may have forgotten for a while, and because we haven't really mentioned emperors since we talked about the late 19th century. But there were still emperors. The French had maintained uh, a succession of emperors uh, on the grounds that, look at, you know, this is in fact the ruler of Vietnam. We're just here helping. You know, that was the, the fiction uh, that they had maintained. And a man named Bao Dai was the latest of these puppet emperors that had been appointed. Uh, he had been in Vietnam um, ever since uh, the 1930s, or had been in and out of Vietnam, I should say. Uh, when the communists came in, uh, the communists, uh, briefly, while they were uh, in power after the end of World War II, uh, they told Bao Dai uh, that he should go away, otherwise they'd kill him. Uh, so he left Vietnam and went to uh, the French Riviera, where he'd been a number of times over the years. He really liked living in the French Riviera much more than living in Vietnam. Um, but then the French went back, as we know, and occupied Vietnam again. And the French said, well, you're going to have to leave the Riviera uh, and come back to Vietnam because we need an emperor again, because okay? we're back in charge. Uh, and of course, the reason was that they were paying, they paid him a subsidy to live a very comfortable life. And if he didn't come back from the Riviera, he wouldn't get the subsidy. Uh, so he came back um, to Vietnam, but then Dien Bien Vu occurred, and uh, the communists said, you know, <laughs> we didn't want you the last time, we don't want you this time, you'll have to leave. So he left and went back to the Riviera, and then the Americans came and said, well, you know, now we're going to be in charge of the South, we need an emperor. Hmm? Come on back. So he got to be emperor once again, even though he'd much rather be emperor of the French Riviera. Um, so this was a stopgap measure on the part of the Americans to get somebody in there. You know, who is ruling the South? I mean, who is this? Well, we got an emperor, okay? He was the emperor of Vietnam before. He's the emperor of Vietnam now. Uh, and Diem's role initially was to go in as the prime minister, the man who would you know, run the government. But very quickly, it became apparent that if they were going to have firm control over the situation, they really wanted Diem to have full control. And so they want to set up a presidential system. And to do that, they need an election. So they're going to run a national election. And the candidates to rule Vietnam are going to be either you know, the emperor, Bao Dai, or the prime minister, Diem, who they've just brought back from the US. And Lansdale is in charge of the national election. He's going to be running Diem's campaign, in essence. And if we go back to the slide again, uh, Lansdale will pull out all the stops. He will use all the advertising. Uh, tricks that he has learned over the years. Uh, for example, the color chosen to represent DM's uh, movement and the color of the ballots for him were red, uh, which is a po positive uh, color uh, in Vietnamese culture, whereas Bao Dai's uh, ballots and the color for his group was to be green, uh, which is the symbol of a cuckold, in other words, a man whose uh, wife is cheating on him, basically. Uh, so everything possible was done to sort of <laughs> tilt the uh, outcome in favor of Diem. However, uh, Lansdale urged Diem not to directly manipulate the vote. Uh, his point to Diem was, look, with everything I know and with all the money we're spending on your campaign, you're certain to win. But we don't want it to be overdone, if you know what I mean. We don't want you going in there and stuffing the ballot boxes because we're confident you'll win. Uh, by a comfortable majority. But Diem was inclined otherwise. And in fact, he did stuff the ballot boxes so that 98% of the vote went to Diem. You know, and that just doesn't happen unless you know, you're Saddam Hussein or someone like that. Uh, you don't get 98% of the vote uh, in any real democratic election. But here uh, begins a long story of conflict between Diem and the CIA. And each side tells a different story about what happened. Diem would say over the years that the problem for him and his administration was that the CIA was only concerned about security. They didn't really care about representative government. And that most of the things that they did 
were to establish security rather than win popular support. The CIA makes just the opposite argument, that as much as they tried to get DiEM to build a mass base of support in the South, he was always preoccupied instead with simply having control. They argue that he was, in essence, and he had been. He had been a bureaucrat in the old French colonial administration, uh, even before he became a nationalist. And that, that was his mentality, was that he'd be fine you know, as a bureaucrat simply telling people what to do, but he really didn't have the makings of a popular democratic leader. And therefore, their efforts always fell short. You can believe what you want. The truth is, in the end, that most of what the CIA does with DM in the years between 1954 and 1963 is inclined towards building a security apparatus rather than building popular support. Each side would point the finger at the other and say, well, it's really their fault. You know? <laughs> this would have turned out differently if it hadn't been for them. The fact is, whoever you want to blame, most of what was done was indeed aimed at security and not at building a democratic process. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, we can say that the Americans in particular have responsibility for one definite step away from democracy. And that was that, of course, in the Geneva Agreement, <coughs> the understanding was clearly established that national elections, meaning North and South combined, were to be held within two years. In other words, no later than 1956. And those elections would select a leader for a reunited Vietnam. Those elections would never be held. And the Americans specifically rejected the idea of national election. President Eisenhower later explained in his memoirs that everyone that he talked to that knew anything about Southeast Asia assured him that if that national election was held, uh, the communist Ho Chi Minh would win. And so they didn't hold the election. And that was the simple fact. And it was an accurate fact. Ho Chi Minh had won this reputation as the national leader of Vietnam. Communist or not, the fact is people saw him as the person, you know, he was here fighting the French, and then he was there fighting, you know, and now he's been resisting the Americans. He is the one figure that emerges as the national leader. Diem, yeah, he fought the Japanese and he fought the French to a degree, but, you know, he's been gone for years. He's been in exile. He wasn't here during the tough slog in the early 1950s once, you know, he headed into exile. He wasn't around anymore. So Ho Chi Minh is the one that established this reputation as the national liberator of Vietnam, and therefore the Americans were at a distinct disadvantage in that regard. Now, despite the refusal of the Americans to hold the election, Ho Chi Minh did not want to take up arms against the South. His point of view was that Diem does not have a strong political base in the South. He can't survive. And sooner or later, the Americans are going to be forced by instability in the South to hold that national election. I know they don't want to. I know they said no now. But we'll wait a couple of years. And in time, they'll be forced to do this, not because they want to, but because there really is no other solution for them to get out of Vietnam by allowing that national election to take place. So initially, Ho Chi Minh, even after the non-occurrence of elections in 1956, was unwilling to take a highly aggressive stance against Diem. That doesn't mean that he wasn't going to have political operatives working against Diem in the South, uh, but he was opposed to taking up arms. Now, if we go back to the slide, we'll see that in the South, Diem is making some efforts to build a base of support. One of the things that he will do is launch a land reform program. Clearly, 
anyone that knew Vietnam knew that one of the major problems for Vietnam was the loss of land among peasants that had been going on ever since the 19th century under the French. So Diem proposes turning over land to peasants. Unfortunately, there are several problems here. One is that during the struggle against the French, the communists had already done this with many people, including people in the South, uh, had handed land back to them. And they'd go into a village, one way of you know, winning support, they'd go into an area, uh, and if the local landlord was dumb enough to actually stick around, um, they'd bring him out, put him on trial, about 20 minutes, and then shoot him, and say, okay, <laughs> that's the end of him, and now, all you folks, you know, and they'd gather the villages, all you folks, remember that land that you had that belonged to your village? It belongs to you again. Go back and take it. When Dan comes along, much of that land was taken back by the landowning families. And that was logical because one base of support that Diem did have, besides Catholics in general, uh, was the landowning class. So clearly he was going to try to make them happy by giving them the land back. The land reform program that he does propose proves to be very limited in terms of the amount of land. Some government land is turned over to people. Uh, but even when land is turned over to people, people have to pay for it. When the communists gave it, they just said, here, it's yours. So, the land reform program, as much as it's well-intentioned uh, to win support among the peasants, has a limited impact because, first of all, not a lot of land is distributed. And secondly, people have to pay for it. And third, this is all going to be very limited because Diem's base of support is really not among the peasants. It's among landowners. Another question uh, that comes up in terms of building a base of support is the Catholic question. There are several million Catholics in the South, including a million who had come from the North. And that's an important base of support for him because he is Catholic. But on the other hand, Catholics are a minority in Vietnam. Even with the extra million in the South, they're still only about 10% of the population. And many people feel that Diem fills his government with Catholics. You now that these are the people he trusts because they're his co-religious uh, supporters and Therefore, many Vietnamese are alienated because, particularly the Buddhists, for example, because they feel that the government shows an undue preference for Catholics, not only in hiring in the government, but also in terms of land reform programs. Many of the people who get land under the land reform program are Catholics who came from the north. You know, this is the reward from them coming to the south. So as much as the Catholics give him a core of support, it also means he has support among a minority of the population, and many other people are furious in him because he feel, they feel he favors the Catholics over them. Diem's attitude towards criticism was he didn't like it, and he tended to respond negatively. If we look at the last part of the slide here, uh, by 1958, there were more than 50,000 political prisoners in the South. In other words, people who had been arrested for being political opponents of the government. And most of these people wound up in jail, not because they took up arms against the regime, but because they were critical of the regime. So an environment is created which is not very conducive uh, to a democratic system or building popular support because so many people get arrested because they happen to oppose the government. Now, on the other side, the communist side, uh, the communists in the South, those who had remained after uh, the Geneva Agreement and after many of them did repatriate to the North, those who remained in the South, and most of them were from the South, they had grown up there, are organizing themselves uh, under the rubric of the National Liberation Front. And what they are doing with the National Liberation Front is that they are creating a series of organizations or incorporating into the National Liberation Front existing organizations that are opposed to Diem. These may be professional groups like lawyers' organizations, uh, teachers' associations, village groups, mothers' associations, all joining this National Liberation Front on the grounds that they're all opposed to the Diem regime. So they are politically organizing, and they're trying to reach beyond their own numbers, beyond the communists per se, and try to bring into their ranks anybody that's opposed to the regime. Now, that doesn't mean that 
all opponents of the regime join the National Liberation Front by any means. But what it means is the communists are trying to build their own base of support. That, you, know, you don't have to be a communist to join us because you can join the, the National Liberation Front. Uh, the communists in the South, particularly after 1956, are increasingly disenchanted with Ho Chi Minh because he keeps saying you're not to take up arms against Diem. And yet, the communists in the South are saying, yeah, but you're not down here, man. You know, they're shooting at us. We're getting killed. Hmm. Well, we're trying to organize politically. So it's fine for you to say to be patient. Meanwhile, they're taking pot shots at us. And in fact, although Ho Chi Minh won't approve armed struggle in the South until 1959, by 1957, the communists in the South were organizing and arming themselves anyways, because they felt like they had to fend off uh, the government that it's a question of, well, if it's either kill or be killed. If we don't shoot them, they'll shoot us. So if we're going to go on organizing politically, we're going to have to also have a military arm that can deal with the government in its attempt to eliminate us. What I think is significant here, other than the fact that it would be 1959 before Ho Chi Minh said, okay, you know, now we're engaged in armed struggle in the South, is that all along the communists kept a major focus on political organization, on developing contacts and creating a support network. That would be very important in their ability uh, to influence events in Vietnam, including conducting a guerrilla war. Because in the end, if you're going to have a guerrilla insurgency, you need widespread support among people. And you do that by building a political network. Now, as the communists in the South start to move into arming themselves and fighting the government, the government, in turn, is taking a series of measures to combat the communists and any other armed opponent. If we look back at the slide again, we'll see First of all, the creation of what are known as the Village Self-Defense Corps. In other words, people in individual villages would get some basic training uh, in military tactics so that they could protect their own village from the communists. Secondly, the creation of a civil guard. These would be a militia that would operate on a provincial basis. Okay, so you'd have the Defense Corps in the villages and then operating on a larger basis another group of part-time soldiers, if you want to call them, militia, who would operate in a province. The government also sets up its own political party called the Khan Lao. However, the Khan Lao turned out to be largely made up of people who worked for the government uh, and who had to pay dues, and whose main job was not to go out and create political support, but to serve as an intelligence network, to spy on their neighbors and report people who are disloyal to the government. So even this supposed political institution is, in fact, an intelligence institution. With the help of the CIA, the government also set up the National Interrogation Center. This is a place where people were to be brought to be interrogated uh, who were suspected particularly of communist affiliation, but generally of political disloyalty who might be subversives of one kind or another. And not surprisingly, the practices at the National Interrogation Center were not the most pleasant. You know, this is where people get stripped naked, you throw a bucket of water on them, you strap them to a spring mattress, and then you attach a car battery to the mattress. And very quickly, uh, they get the idea they're going to have to talk. Uh, but this is where people were brought to be interrogated. Uh, from across the country who were suspected of being subversives. Another technique that was used uh, was that uh, a census was instituted, and Vietnam certainly needed one. I mean, there was a very unclear idea of, well, how many people do we have? You know, what ages are they? What occupations are they? All that stuff. There hadn't been a census done. So a census is instituted by the Diem government. However, many of the census takers were actually trained as intelligence interrogators that many of the questions that they would ask would be designed to try to identify, again, people who were subversives in cities or in villages or out in the countryside in general. So again, we have what should be simply an objective national exercise to gain information uh, to be used for purposes of economic development, etc. 
Instead, it turns into another effort to carry out uh, intelligence activities within Vietnam. Another institution created at this time, uh, with the assistance of the CIA, uh, you can see the American part coming right through just in the name, it was the Vietnamese Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> Federal Bureau of Investigation, they just changed one word. Uh, and it, too, basically had an intelligence function. It was to be the major source for, supposedly, for counterintelligence activities. In other words, finding spies in the government and that sort of thing. Now, as military activity in the countryside increases, as the fighting begins to pick up, in the, at the end of the 1950s. The government will launch, again, with the assistance of the CIA, two initiatives. One that begins in 1959 was called Agrivilles. The other one that began a couple of years later was called Strategic Hamlets. They were essentially the same. You know, they just changed the name, different administration. You go from Eisenhower to Canada, you get a different name for what was basically the same thing. We'll call them Strategic Hamlets. The Strategic Hamlet concept was this that it isn't enough to create the self-defense core in the villages, because in many cases, the villages are already infiltrated by communists. So in many cases, we're training people in the self-defense core who are commies. That's not going to help keep the commies out of that village. So we have to clean this up. We have to get villages that don't have any communists and that are indeed capable of protecting themselves. So this is what we will do. We will build new villages called strategic hamlets. We'll dig moats around them. They'll build stockade fences as protection. Now the villages will do this, of course. And before people move in, we'll interrogate all of them to identify the communists and weed them out. So we know that the people actually move in to the strategic hamlet are the non-communists. And then they can use that to protect themselves, and of course, that will keep the communists from using the people in the village. And the people in the villages are very vitally important because they provide food to the guerrillas, they provide intelligence information, you know, where are the government forces today, etc., what are they doing? We'll deny them those resources by getting people into strategic hamlets. By the early 60s, this had become a major initiative of the Kennedy administration, and uh, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara visited South Vietnam and was very pleased to see that strategic hamlets were springing up all over the place. And he was conducted on a tour by this man, Colonel Pham Nguyen. Uh, the colonel informed McNamara that thousands of hamlets had been created and that pretty soon strategic hamlets would dominate the countryside in the South. What he didn't tell the secretary was that he was a communist. And he was developing the hamlets at breakneck speed because he knew the villages hated the hamlets. So the more hamlets he built, the more people hated the government. So the strategic hamlet policy was being used, in fact, by a communist in the South Vietnamese government to alienate peasants even more from the government. Now, aside from what the colonel did, the fact is that, indeed, the peasants didn't like the hamlets. First of all, the hamlets were new villages. And what usually happened is that because many villages were relatively small with just a handful of families, there was no practical way that they could do a separate hamlet to replace each village. So they would often consolidate a number of villages together. That was bad for two reasons. One, it often meant for many of the villages, almost inevitably, that they were going to have to move further away from the rice paddies that they worked. So now they were going to have to spend more time every day just getting to the rice paddies to grow their rice. Even worse, these strategic hamlets were not their villages. We have looked at how important the villages, the clan, in terms of peasant life. And here, the Americans were coming in and blowing all that apart. Said, you know, but the spirits of my ancestors occupy the site of our village. 
And you're telling me to just up and leave and move into this thing you call a strategic hamlet, and you're throwing me in with that clan from across the river, and we hate their guts. <laughs> and they hate us. So in many cases, these, you know, there just wasn't any acknowledgement of these complexities. And the idea just, was just so appealing. It had been used, for example, by the British in Malaysia, and it seemed to work fairly effectively in denying support for a communist insurgency there, although it turns out conditions were also very different in, in that country. But in any case, it seemed to him be the ideal strategy. Deny the guerrillas in the countryside the support of the villagers. But in fact, of course, it was alienating more and more of them and driving them further away from the government. Now, the CIA, besides this variety of activities, you know, creating the Vietnamese Bureau of Investigation, self-defense course, strategic hamlets, and all the other stuff, you know, helping to run elections. They're also involved in intelligence assessment. That's, of course, another part of what the CIA does. And between 1962 and 1963, the CIA, under John McCone, who is now Director of Central Intelligence, undertook an overall assessment of conditions in the South. The Kennedy administration wants to know, how is it going? You know, are we winning this thing? They realize there's an increasing guerrilla insurgency. By now, Ho Chi Minh has approved the taking up of arms in the South. He's now providing support uh, for the communists in the South. So the Kennedy administration knows that maybe things aren't going so hot. Uh, but the CIA assessment is very positive. It's very taken up with these ideas about strategic hamlets and nation building and all the work that's being done there. The US Agency for International Development is pouring aid in, uh, land reform programs, uh, the building up of military capacity, all of these security measures that the CIA has helped take. And so the outlook from the CIA's point of view at this point in time, their assessment is a positive one, that things are working out. We need to do more of the same, more of it, more intensive. In fact, Vietnam was edging ever closer, particularly by the beginning of 1963, towards chaos. The insurgency in the countryside was growing rapidly. The Diem regime proved increasingly incapable of countering that insurgency. Diem's concerns were to preserve his regime. And his greatest concerns had to do with preserving his regime against his own military. There were numerous conspiracies against the Diem government from its own military. In fact, one of the things inhibiting the fight against the communists in the countryside was Diem's policy in terms of appointing military leaders to the counterinsurgency campaign. The basic rule of thumb was this. If you're a loyal member of the military, in other words, you support the regime and, you know, we know you, you're, connect, you're a Catholic or you're connected to our family, you know, you haven't been involved in any plotting, then we give you an appointment in one of the major urban areas. Because, of course, if somebody's going to stage a coup, what they're going to try to do is seize you know, a large military base in an urban area. They're going to try to take the capital. So we want those military leaders to be the most loyal ones that we can find. As far as who gets sent out to the countryside to fight the guerrillas, all this scum that we think might try to stage a coup against us, we'll throw all those people out there. The main issue wasn't. Is this guy good at military tactics? Is he good at counterinsurgency? Is he a courageous leader that will lead his troops and inspire them? Well, we don't care. Yeah, what we care about is him uh, or his political leanings, or his suspected political leanings. Not that he's a communist necessarily, but if he's got political ambitions and might try to overthrow the M, we'll throw him out in the countryside, even if he's an idiot when it comes to running combat operations. And people knew, soldiers knew. The reason we have Commander X is because he he's suspected of the government of conspiring against it. Furthermore, Diem had alienated much of the population. Buddhist monks, for example, uh, were leading a campaign against the regime. They felt that Catholics were being treated with inordinate 
uh, favoritism by the regime and that there was a bias against Buddhists. Uh, Buddhist monks had literally uh, burned themselves to death in the streets of Saigon and other cities as a demonstration of their absolute opposition to the regime. So there is mounting political opposition publicly in the urban centers, and there are these ongoing conspiracies within the military. The one thing that's really keeping a lid on the military is the insistence from Washington, from the Kennedy administration, that if the military overthrows Diem, that's the end of U.S. aid. You, know, you can go out and fight the commies on your own, but we won't be there. Whether they'd follow through on that is another matter, but that was the threat. And that's what helped keep most of the conspirators in line that, well, you know, fine, you may seize the government, but then if the U.S. pulls out all its aid, what will happen to you? So that's one of the few things that's keeping things intact or holding things together. But by the late summer of 1963, the Kennedy administration became convinced that Diem just wasn't going to cut it. Now, he'd had nine years back in Vietnam now, and the insurgency was growing. He had very little popular support other than Catholics and family members. Uh, there was this constant instability in the military. So he was going to have to go. And they decided that the easiest way to do it was, well, all these guys are conspiring in the military. All we have to do is let a few of them know it's okay now. We won't object to seeing this guy disappear. Uh, and that'll be it. Uh, the emissary for this, if we go back to the slide, was Lucien Conen, the same CIA officer who had been sent to the north you know, to assist the stay-behinds and help destabilize uh, the communist regime back in 1954. Because, of course, Conen had been in Vietnam. He knew many of these military officers from years before. He's fluent in French again, so he can uh, speak to them directly. And his message to the senior office in the military was that, look, like, if there's a coup and Diem is replaced, the United States is not going to cut off assistance. You know, they didn't, you know, Kennedy would say, well, we didn't encourage the coup. You know, we didn't, you know, direct this coup. And that's true. They didn't. But they knew all they had to tell these guys. They knew these guys were conspiring. They knew the names of the leading conspirators. All they had to do is go over and say, look, don't worry about it. We're not going to shut off the aid pipe if you overthrow Diem. Now, In the fall of 1963, the plan is underway. It is Kennedy's understanding that what's going to happen is Diem and his brothers, he has several brothers, one of whom is particularly close to him in terms of political administration, uh, will be arrested and deported from the country, probably sent off to Cambodia or wherever, uh, maybe a, an island somewhere, and that'll be the end of them. And indeed, the coup is launched, and Diem and his brother are captured after they try to flee the city, and they're being brought back in an armored personnel carrier, uh, but they are not going to make it back alive to the capital. Uh, their convoy stops, and uh, they open up the personnel carrier, and they open fire on the two men and kill both of them. Uh, the idea was, among the conspirators, Dim was just too dangerous. You know, if they let him go and send him into exile, he'd still conspire against them and might be able to pull something off and overthrow them and what would happen to them. So to avoid the problem, they killed him. So Kennedy could well argue that he didn't you know, ever intend the assassination. That's true. But they certainly, uh, he and his advisors and the US ambassador um, to Vietnam at this time, they knew what was going on. They, they had set this process in motion by telling the conspirators not to worry about US support. And Diem was, in fact, removed from the scene. However, it hardly improves things because, as I, you can see on the slide, over the next 18 months, there are six different governments in South Vietnam, and usually various combinations of civilian and military leaders, one group replacing another in a series of largely nonviolent military coups. But the chaos, if anything, gets worse But this revolving door government uh, that comes into existence after Diem's assassination. So, in fact, Instead of stabilizing the situation, the intervention that leads to his overthrow and his assassination ultimately only makes things worse. Again, the CIA is called upon, as the situation does get worse, to reevaluate. In 1965, the CIA provides another overall assessment of the situation in Vietnam. And its assessment is 
Things are getting worse <laughs> by the moment. Uh, they're not getting better. But it would be a mistake to commit large numbers of U.S. troops to the battle. Now, at this point, there are thousands, over 6,000 U.S. advisors in South Vietnam, U.S. military personnel who have been sent there over the years to serve as advisors. So technically, they're not combat troops. They're there to train and to assist, but they actually do go on patrols with the South Vietnamese Army. They provide assistance, and of course, if they get caught in a firefight, they don't just sit there. They engage in combat, and a number of them have been killed already in that capacity. But that has been the limit. There has been no commitment of U.S. combat troops up to 1965. And the CIA's assessment is that, look, with this insurgency, our military would not work very well at subduing an insurgency. The CIA felt that it had a certain expertise, it had certainly been involved in a number of counterinsurgency efforts, including the one in Vietnam, uh, through the 1950s and into the 1960s. And from their point of view, conventional military tactics and conventional military forces aren't going to be very good at solving the problem. So they recommend against that. So much for their recommendation. So this time they got it right. Mm -hmm. uh, this time, indeed, the prospects for success by injecting U.S. military forces are not good, but nobody's listening to them this time. The Johnson administration is increasingly convinced that they have to salvage the situation and that it will have to be done through military force. Uh, one of the events that occurs at this time uh, is the Tonkin Gulf uh, incident. Uh, a U.S. destroyer is attacked by uh, North Vietnamese torpedo boats off the coast of North Vietnam. Um, and then on a second occasion, there is supposedly an attack one which probably never occurred. Uh, what happened was that the uh, sailors on two vessels, two U.S. Navy vessels, reported sonar contacts indicating that they were under attack, that there were torpedoes being fired at them. Uh, but as far as anyone could figure out afterwards, uh, and indeed, that never happened. What they were seeing were yeah, blips on a screen, but they weren't torpedoes, and there were no North Vietnamese torpedo boats out there. But President Johnson gets authorization from Congress, essentially, to carry out combat missions against North Vietnam as a result of this incident. And this begins a steady progress uh, beginning in late 1964 and carrying on to 1965 of escalating the military side of the, com uh, the conflict in Vietnam. The State Department joins in this effort uh, with a white paper called Aggression from the North. Uh, a State Department white paper is uh, when the government wants to make a case, like why do we want to attack uh, Iraq, or et cetera, uh, the State Department comes out with a white paper that sort of lays out the argument on behalf of the United States. And in this white paper, uh, they cite evidence of uh, caches of uh, communist manufactured weapons, Czech weapons, for example. Uh, weapons made in Czechoslovakia uh, that were found buried on the beaches in South Vietnam uh, that were obviously put there by the North Vietnamese providing support to the communists in the South. Uh, in fact, the weapons were buried there by the CIA. Uh, they keep warehouses of weapons, and they still do. You know, weapons made in Czechoslovakia, you know, what was East Germany, Soviet Union, etc. Because if they want to supply people with weapons, you know, they don't want to supply them with M16s because then everybody will know, well, those had to come from the Americans. But if you give them, you know, weapons made in what were then communist countries, you're going to say, well, yeah, the commies did it. Uh, it wasn't that the North wasn't supplying the South. It was that the Americans couldn't come up with clear evidence that they were. So they invented some evidence and just put it in the white paper to make the argument. Uh, the other argument uh, was a postage stamp. And the postage stamp shows uh, several Vietnamese peasants uh, rising up from a rice paddy with their mm -hmm. black pajamas on and so forth. And they're clearly communist insurgents because they're firing weapons at U.S. helicopters overhead. Uh, the stamp was allegedly produced by the National Liberation Front in the South. And of course, 
the State Department argument is that this couldn't have been manufactured by people in the South. This is a highly sophisticated stamp. It had to be done in the North. And in fact, Life magazine on March 6, 1965, if you want to look it up, uh, its front cover was this stamp. You know, that's how important it was considered. That this was you know, clear evidence of what was going on. Uh, and again, uh, the CIA made it up. Uh, they knew that the North was helping the South. They just couldn't get concrete evidence, so they made some up. But the idea was to justify that this is not, the point was, this is not a revolution. This is an invasion from the North. The North is invading the South, and therefore we have to respond and protect our ally, South Vietnam. Uh, that argument then leads the Johnson administration, if we look at the slide again, to initiate Operation Rolling Thunder. Uh, this was to be an ongoing aerial bombardment of North Vietnam that would continue for years. And the idea was to essentially destroy the North's war-making capacity and destroy their capacity to ship weapons to the South. So to blow up factories, railroads, highways, you name it. Um, the problem with this strategy, by the way, was simply this, that the North really wasn't a very industrialized country anyways. They were getting most of their military supplies from the Soviet Union and Eastern European countries. So if you blew up their factories, you really weren't destroying their war-making capacity because they got most of that stuff from other communist countries. And they proved incredibly adept at you know, either rebuilding bridges and roads or using bicycles to transport the stuff down to the south. But the bombing would go on for a number of years. And then in March, in March 6, 1965, the first U.S. Marines are sent there, uh, the beginning of a buildup that will see 550,000 U.S. troops sent into Vietnam. So from this point on, uh, from March of 1965, Vietnam is becoming increasingly a military conflict. And the CIA still has an important role to play, but it is not the dominant force that it had been up to this point. One of the areas where the CIA still has a role to play was uh, in counterterrorism. Uh, and what this meant was to use tactics that the communists had used against them. Uh, among these tactics were the provincial reconnaissance units. Provincial reconnaissance units uh, were to be sent out. They would include people from Army Special Forces, CIA people. Uh, and they were to go out and essentially fight in the countryside as small guerrilla units themselves to attack the communists. Now, the communist idea was uh, they would lay in wait for a large you know, South Vietnamese or U.S. military unit and ambush it. Uh, well, the provincial reconnaissance units would act as small units themselves and ambush the communists. So that was a tactic particularly promoted uh, by the CIA and assisted by them. The CIA has another vitally important role to play, and that is the overall assessment of enemy strength. This became a major debate within the decision-making groups of the United States involved in Vietnam. And the bottom line was simply this. The military said that the number of communists in the South was perhaps a few hundred thousand. Hmm? Three, four, five hundred thousand, maybe. The CIA said, no, we're talking a million, two million. Now, three million? Somebody's got to be wrong, right? Part of this was a disagreement over, you know, who do you count? The military said, look, you count just the people that have a weapon in their hands. That's a communist insurgent. The CIA said, no, it isn't just the guy with a weapon in his hand. It's all those people that are carrying food for him, carrying weapons for him, medical personnel, uh, villagers that actively work on behalf of the communists, that spy for them, etc., etc., then the numbers grow. The military didn't want to accept this because, of course, their strategy was called the meat grinder strategy. We just will kill so many communists that pretty soon there won't be enough of them to carry on an insurgency. And that would work if you were dealing with a few hundred thousand. But if you were dealing with several million, you could go on forever like that. In the end, the Johnson administration chose to believe the smaller number of the military. And we went on and on and on <laughs> and kept fighting. 
And not that the North wasn't sending down reinforcements as well, but the fact is there were a huge number of people in the South that were supporting the regime, I mean, supporting the insurgency. So the CIA has an important role there, but again, as with its 1965 assessment, it is in belief. The administration has set itself on a course. We're following a meat grinder strategy. You're out of luck. Your intelligence disagrees with what we're already doing. Tough luck. It's like Dulles and Cuba, you know. If you disagree with what we've decided on, tough. A turning point in the war comes with the Tet Offensive in 1968. It was a mass uprising by the communists where they attacked major urban areas, including Saigon, seized many cities in the south, and it led to months of bloody fighting uh, as the U.S. and the South Vietnamese fought to regain these cities. In the end, they succeeded in driving off the communists. The military, the U.S. military argued, we won. You know, they tried to seize control of the country, and we beat them. And indeed, the communists would later say, after the war was over, that this was a major setback for them, that they indeed hoped that there would be a mass uprising, and they would topple the regime. But the real effect was at home, because people became convinced that, look, we've been fighting here for how long? You know, it's 1968, we've had, you know, half a million troops there, and after three years, they still can launch this kind of offensive. We're not winning, we're losing. The CIA, meanwhile, was making its own effort to counter the continuing strength of the communists in Operation Phoenix, essentially an assassination operation which killed 22,000 communists uh, in the period from 1968 to 1971. Hit squads were sent out to assassinate known communist cadre, in other words, people that were participating in the insurgency to go and find them in their villages at night and shoot them. Uh, this is later reported in Congress, as we talked about when we talked about the history of the CIA. Uh, originally, the argument was, well, they were actually shot trying to escape, but in fact, it was an assassination program. And probably one of the more effective programs that the CIA ran at this time was that the U.S. ran. But the larger reality for most Americans is that the American death toll is rising. Tens of thousands of Americans have been killed, and there's no clear end in sight. Finally, the Nixon administration admits that they have no solution to this problem. They have found that in Vietnam, the regime is deeply penetrated by communist agents, thousands and thousands of them. The CIA has helped identify them. They don't even dare tell how many there are because it will undermine believe that there's any hope of winning the war. The Nixon administration settles on a policy of Vietnamization. And as we see here, the U.S. steadily reduces the number of U.S. troops in Vietnam from 415,000 in 1970 down to 42,000 in 1972, churning more and more of the war over to the South because U.S. support was disintegrating. The great Cold War consensus was coming to an end as American casualties increased. An armistice is reached between the U.S. and the communists in 1973. The U.S. pulls out the last of its troops and the communists roll to victory, capturing Saigon in the fall of 1975. The war had finally come to an end. The Americans had lost. Now, again, we have to qualify evaluating all this because the CIA is extremely important, but they're not the only factor. Obviously, more and more after 1965, the military played a major role. But if we look at this just from the CIA's perspective, or largely from that perspective, we see factors here coming into play that we've seen elsewhere, even though the role of the CIA here is to preserve a regime, not to undermine it. Political participation. Political participation was high in Vietnam, but that also meant that a large number of people were supporting the communists, and that the government was, in fact, in terms of political support, a minority government. So we have high participation, but much of it is participation against the government. As far as coherence of the state, as we've seen, the military was constantly plotting against the Diem regime. And even when Diem is gone, 
there are constant turnovers in government. So here you're trying to fight a counterinsurgency over a number of years with a highly unstable government whose own constituent parts, particularly the military, are not terribly loyal to the state itself. And a state that is riven with communist agents. Economic conditions, you can say, are relatively positive because the U.S. poured in billions of dollars of economic aid to keep the South Vietnamese economy growing. But in terms of its own security apparatus, as I said, the communists couldn't even, I mean, the South Vietnamese government couldn't even keep thousands of communist agents out of its own ranks. So with the exception of economic factors, everything else weighs against the success of the CIA. As far as domestic conditions, yes, there is support for the CIA for this operation initially. But by the end of the 1960s, with U.S. casualties rising, the Cold War consensus has ended, and people want out of Vietnam. Things will never be the same. Presidents will never be able to run an unchallenged foreign policy. As for the CIA, its performance is mixed. Good counterinsurgency efforts at times, poor assessments at other times. Largely, they had chosen a case that they couldn't win because of domestic factors, factors in Vietnam. We see the historical crisis of an unfinished revolution, disaffected peasants and middle class, the U.S. looking to build nationhood, to fight off communism and prove that it has a world vision to counter communism. It can build a democratic capitalist system in a third world country. Those are the combined motivations. Tactics are across the board, from psychological warfare to paramilitary efforts to assassination. You name it, we tried it. Economic aid, we tried it. In the end, the outcome is driven both by conditions in Vietnam, lack of coherence in the state, lack of security, and by a changing attitude in the U.S., the disintegration of the Cold War consensus that was destroyed permanently as a result of this war. Next time, we'll look at another case and see a post-Vietnam world and how the U.S. deals with it.